live on YouTube. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on to Zoom, they can watch it live. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I got a haircut yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, now, it's already muted. Okay. I put it on where it just shows the presenter, so I'm not for sure of why it's showing everybody. Welcome to the fourth annual Sickle Cell Awareness Meeting entitled Come Hub With Us. I am your host, Monica Rockwell. We're going to get started with our loving kindness practice to get us started with this meeting and to get us relaxed. So take it away, Mr. Spencer. All right. All right. So welcome, everyone. I'm excited to be here today. And I'm going to jump right into this loving kindness practice. Um, specifically, the loving kindness practice is my, my favorite practice. Um, in this practice, we're going to show ourselves love and kindness. We're going to show um, our community love and kindness. Um, other, under, uh, other individuals in our life, we're going to show them love and kindness as well. So I'll guide you through this practice. Um, I have my trusty timer here that I'm setting up for us for 10 minutes. Um, and during that 10 minutes, we'll, we'll do this practice. So inviting you to find a comfortable seated position for yourself. A seated position that allows you to cultivate awareness of your body and of your breath. And also inviting you, if you can, to just move up just about an inch from the back of the seat that you're sitting in to give a little space between your back and the actual chair you're sitting in. Um, because at a certain point, we may do some core, um, filling into our core, and I want to make sure that the back is straight when we do that. All right, when you hit a bell ring three times, inviting you to allow your eyes to close, or if you would like to leave your eyes open, inviting you to lower your gaze as I'm doing right now. And then once you lower your gaze, soften your gaze. Inviting you into the present moment by noticing your inhales and noticing your exhales. Inviting you to notice the sounds around you. Maybe this, listen to the sound of my voice or listen to other sounds that are happening in the room where you are or maybe outside of your home. We'll begin this practice with three deep breaths, inhaling through your nose and exhaling through your mouth. Beginning now, inhaling deeply and exhaling. Inhaling deeply again. And exhaling. One more time, inhaling deeply. Pausing. And exhaling. inviting you to allow your breathing to return to normal. And as you inhale, noticing the breath itself, and as you exhale, gently scanning your body, inhaling, noticing the breath, exhaling and noticing your body. On your next inhale, inviting you to notice the breath, but as you exhale, inviting you to bring to mind, the, to mind an image of yourself. 
inviting you to imagine yourself maybe as a child or imagine yourself as a teenager or young adult. But inviting you to bring to mind an image of yourself. And once you have that image in mind, inviting you to place one hand on your chest right above your heart and recite the following. May I be happy. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I be safe. May I be fit. Mr. Spencer, you got muted. There we are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So inviting you back to the breath, gently noticing your inhales and exhales. On your next inhale, inviting you to bring to mind your relatives inviting you to imagine your mom or dad, imagine cousins, uncles and sisters and brothers, aunts and other family members, inviting you to widen your imagination to include significant others and loved ones, best friends, people that you hold dear in your heart, inviting you to bring them to mind. And once you have them to my, in mind, inviting you along with yourself to recite the following to yourself. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be safe. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be safe. May, be, may we be filled with loving kindness. Inviting you to allow the image of your family members, relatives and loved ones to fade from your mind's eye as you rejoin your breath and body, gently scanning the body as you exhale and noticing the breath as you inhale. On your next inhale, inviting you to bring to mind a community member or neighbor, an acquaintance, an associate, individuals that are part of your life, but they're not very personal. Maybe someone you know at the local grocery store that you wave to as you leave your home or as you walk or run. Inviting you to bring those people to mind. And once you have them in mind, inviting you to recite the following to them and inviting you to include yourself in that as well. May we be happy May we be healthy. May we be safe. May we be filled with love and kindness. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be safe. May we be filled with love and kindness. Inviting you to Allow the image of the acquaintances that you've brought to mind to fade from your mind's eye in rejoining your breath and body. On your next inhale, inviting you to bring to mind someone that you may have a conflict with, 
someone that there's a simple disagreement that needs to be rectified and that will be rectified soon. Inviting you not to bring to mind someone who's caused you tremendous amounts of trauma, but inviting you to think of someone where there's a simple disagreement. And once you have that person or people in mind, inviting you to include yourself in saying the following, may we be happy, may we be healthy, may we be safe, may we be filled with loving kindness. May we be happy, may we be safe. May we be healthy, may we be filled with loving kindness. Inviting you to allow the image of the person that you brought to mind to fade from your mind's eye. And gently check into your body as you exhale. Inhaling, noticing your breath, and exhaling and noticing your body, and inviting you if you feel any places of tension or stress, to gently show that place some compassion. On your next inhale, inviting you to bring to mind an image of your community an image of the city that you are a part of, moving out to the state and country. And if you can, inviting you to include other countries in your imagination and moving it all the way out until you can include the whole world. And once you have the whole world in mind and including yourself, inviting you to recite the following. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be safe. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be safe. May we be filled with loving kindness. Inviting you back to your breath and body, noticing your inhales and exhales. Inviting you to open your eyes if you haven't already. Thank you for your practice with me today. And I hand it back over to Monica. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Spence. I am relaxed now, I am calm. And I do apologize for that error by putting Mr. Spencer on mute for a minute. I heard someone talking and I was trying to mute them. I don't see Toriana. So we're going to go with Dr. Vick. Are you ready, Dr. Vick? I am ready. I just unmuted myself and I'm going to share my screen with you all. Can everyone see? Yes. All right, very good. Okay, so my name is Lori Vick. I am a nurse uh, educator at the University of South Carolina. I am a nurse researcher, and I also am uh, the secretary of the International Association of Sickle Cell Nurses and uh, Professional Associates. And we are currently undertaking the development of nursing curriculum to provide nurses with the education that they will need to provide good quality care to persons that have sickle cell disease. 
So this is um, a project that we've been working on for a few months. Um, we know that we have a, a bit more to go, so it's a work in progress. Um, but let me share with you where we are so far. So the way that we went about putting this together was not the typical way that you might see curriculum developed. Um, typically, you might have a nurse who's an expert in a certain area, and she would make a decision about what she thought would be the appropriate information to uh, provide to nursing students or nurses who are working in the field who are trying to build on their expertise. In this, in our model, um, the Iskanapa model, we use the modified Delphi method. And um, just to make that um, something that um, is more relatable, we look to find consensus among the stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, I mean we sought out patients, people that had sickle cell disease, so they could share with us what their experience has been, what they are looking for in the delivery of care from nurses, and any other thoughts that they have that might help us to do a good job of developing um, the, the curriculum to new nurses, student nurses, and to nurses who are currently working in the field. So we went to patients, we went to parents, we went to healthcare providers, and um, people that were working with patients that had sickle cell. So we sought the help of all folks that would, what we call the stakeholders, to see what um, they would share, what they would bring to the table to help us to mold together this curriculum in a way that we hope will um, result in a very solid um, methodology for nurses to um, use as a model for caregiving when they are working with patients with sickle cell. We did this through surveys. We did it through focus groups. As a matter of fact, we just finished this past week our last focus group with um, people that have sickle cell and parents of people with sickle cell and um, also with healthcare providers. We just held meetings in the past, I would say within the past seven days where we gathered that information. But because we are still currently developing curriculum right now, your input would be appreciated. And I have left my, or put my email here. And if you have anything that you feel would be important to us in the development of uh, the curriculum for nurses, we would appreciate you um, reaching out. And so my e email, lvic at mailbox.sc.edu is um, accessible to you if you would like to um, contribute. So please feel free. The, um, the method that we use in developing curriculum for nursing and for nursing students and nurse, nurses that are currently in practice is um, using the CUSIN model. CUSIN came, is, um, was a group of people or like a consortium of people that came together um, using the Institute of Medicine's model and other types of models. And they came up with the knowledge, attitude, skills and um, we want nurses to have a solid foundation in knowledge and science. We want them to have the skills that are necessary for them to deliver appropriate care at the highest level. We want them to have an attitude of caring. And those attitudes in include um, empathy for patients and their situation and what they share, providing them with the necessary privacy and respect for all people. And then they have to make clinical decisions based on what the patient has provided us in terms of what their experience is. The nurse gathers that information and then we have this collaboration that allows us to make good solid decisions with the patient at the center, at the focus. And, um, and then we go forward, right? So the goal is to um, promote the best possible outcomes. So in order for nurses to do that, they need to have background knowledge. We need to know what sickle cell disease is. 
and I'm going to be very honest with you. I, I've shared this with others. I taught medical surgical nursing for 10 years, and that's where you teach information about hematology and sickle cell disease. And what I saw in the current textbooks was very limited information. And so that means students are likely not getting much information about sickle cell unless they know somebody that has sickle cell, somebody in their family has it, they've had patients that they've worked with. You know, there has to be some context, there has to be some um, actual experience for them to get it. So what I did was I had a friend who had two children with sickle cell and he was a professor and he would come into my class and give them the perspective of what it's like raising two small children. They were young at the time. And um, what, what, what his experience was, what kept him up at night, what was the engagement between um, nurses from the emergency room through the time that the children would be released from the hospital. What was the experience like for them going to see the pediatrician and how did that care go in that environment? So having that background information is not only what's the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease. We absolutely have to have that information, not only knowing that it's a genetic disorder and what that means, but also we need to know what the experience and what has gone on with people's lives. So you will see this repeated theme of us telling, letting people tell their stories because that information really helps us to understand and to work with patients. So nurses, um, to provide the best type of care that we can give, we need to do it from a holistic perspective. And that means looking at the whole person addressing everything. So I say we address it using the bio, psychosocial, spiritual needs of your patients. We look at what's going on with them biologically. We assess their mental health. And because we know when people are in pain or you have acute chest or you have some other a major um, issue going on with your health status, which is the reason why you would be making contact with the healthcare field. Um, there's also this um, emotional and stress that's going on with this physical thing that's happening. We look at what's happening in terms of your social health. What's happening in your environment? Do you have access to the resources that you need? All of that needs to be included. And then I never want to leave out spirituality, addressing the spiritual needs of our patients. We need to, first of all, ask, is this a value to you? If it is, how can we support and serve you? So again, holistic perspective to help make sure that we're doing the things that we need to, to um, help in the caregiving and help the person in the experience that they're having that brings them into contact with us. And there's multiple ways that we can deliver these services. So I have down that medical homes is a part of that part of the system. Inclusion of people that can be support persons or liaisons for uh, patients between the patient and the provider, like a community health worker or a patient navigator. I think sometimes healthcare people are talking one language and patients and people with sickle cell are speaking their language. And if you're having two people, it's like talking two foreign languages to two people and you don't understand each other's um, communication. So sometimes it's important to have that person that knows what knows the background of healthcare and all of that stuff, but also has a relationship, an established relationship with a patient and can say, here, let's bring this together. Let's pull this all together and help to make things work the best. And sometimes too, you need a communication liaison, you know, and that a lot of times we know that's the parents, you know, in the young child, it's the parents. But when people are adults and on their own, where's that liaison and that help? So I think that's an important part of it too. I also am greatly appreciative of technology in the era of COVID. Right. So, I mean, um, I personally have had communication with my healthcare providers through the computer, just like we're doing, like a Zoom or a Teams or um, 
uh, sometimes on a cell phone through other apps that the healthcare providers have had. So this is another way, having that communication is so important and it is a part of this whole of giving care. Um, and, you know, using the technology, the specific role I see here is, say you've had a period of time you were hospitalized because you had something serious come up with your sickle cell. Now you've been discharged your home. Something's going on and it's not quite right. We need to be able to make that call and say, listen, I'm, I'm taking my medicine. This is what's happening. Why am I not feeling better? Or why am I feeling like, oh, something's go, something doesn't feel right? Using that technology might be the, the intervention that can make a difference between somebody not making the outreach or not being able to reach out and, and get the support that they need. And it could also possibly prevent them from having to be re-hospitalized because you made the contact, the doctor or primary care provider recognizes right away, oh, this might be what the issue is. Or, or they may say, please come in because this is concerning to us. So we know that technology, I think it's going to have more and more of a role as time goes on. We're using a lifespan approach um, to the process. So um, all of us have a different area that we're developing the curriculum in. So um, when I say I'm a member of IS Ganapa, we have a subcommittee. So um, Yvonne Carroll, Coretta Generet, um, Dora Clayton Jones, we're all kind of a part of that. And oh, and Pat Corley, don't let, let me leave out Pat. We're part of the subcommittee along with the stakeholders and communities of interest in developing this lifespan approach. So people that um, have expertise in the newborn and preschool age are looking at the issues that are identified here, the initial diagnosis, infections, uh, spleen disorders, pain, et cetera, on down the line. And again, we're gonna um, seek out stories of parents and children um, with that newly diagnosed child and let them share their stories with us. And that'll be a part of the modules that we're developing. The same thing with the school age child. I'm working on that with um, Dr. Clayton Jones. We're gonna look at um, all of these different things, pain, renal complications, skeletal complications, and on down the list. And also ask uh, children, school age children and their parents to share stories of experiences. I think one of the important things in that school age child is to um, talk to the kids in school, let, you know, ha let their, um, their peers know what sickle cell is. Educate the educators, the teachers that are um, interfacing with the children. You know, what did they know about sickle cell? How are they supporting the child in the classroom? Um, what happens when the child's out of school and because they had to be hospitalized or something like that, or they're having so much pain that they just can't, can't focus on school at the time. So what are the support structures that can be in place? So all of those things I think are important to address. And then in these last two, the teen and adolescent. And one of the things I think about most significantly in the teen and adolescent is that transition time. I, am, I and many people in the community, and you all probably know this, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Um, <laughs> you all know what it was like um, or have certainly engaged where a person is transitioning from that care where mom and dad were involved and then they, and now you're going out on your own. And are people listening to you? Are you getting the same support that you got you know, when you were youth, um, if you're not, how do we change that? This might be with an advocate like a um, patient navigator, community health worker would be essential to um, helping in that transition time. And again, stories of the young adult that will make this all so meaningful. I recently spoke with someone who shared with me that they felt hope when they heard about adults and seniors, because they were a younger person. And um, when they hear the stories of people that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, and living with sickle cell, what's their experience? It gives others hope. And I think those stories will be rich too. So anyway, so this is 
th this is where we are. Um, we're probably a little bit further along because we've continued to work since we had our meeting a week ago. Um, and we're hoping that within a year, we will have modules developed. Um, we will have, um, we will start to work on publication of some of this about how we put this together, what our end results are. So we'll look for publishing in journals and we most certainly hope to be sharing this with the, um, uh, uh, the individuals, the publishers of our textbooks that um, would provide, that we could provide more information uh, and important relevant information that nurses need to know when they're gonna be providing care for patients that have sickle cell disease so that we're doing a better job of it. We know that there is definitely work that needs to be done. Okay, so I'm gonna stop talking now and um, turn it back over to Monica or however she would like me to proceed if there are questions or comments. I was gonna wait till the end because I know it's Saturday. I was gonna wait to the end for the questions. Very the, good. the next person that I want to bring on is Mariah Carter. She is the sickle cell account manager for the American Red Cross. And she's gonna talk about the importance of African-American blood donation. Go ahead, you have the floor, Ms. Carter. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna share my screen really quickly. All right, so as Monica stated, um, my name is Mariah Carter and I am one of the sickle cell account managers for American Red Cross. Um, and uh, right now, American Red Cross is needing um, your help and those whom you know um, to help address a critical need. And what that need is, is that we're needing African-American and our Black populations to become blood donors. Um, and we're needing them to become blood donors to help our patients that are battling sickle cell. Um, quite naturally, since mid, about mid-March of 2020, um, we've seen a drastic decline in blood donations from our African-American and Black populations, quite naturally due to the pandemic. Um, but I think it's so important for us to realize that um, sickle cell disease is almost a pandemic within itself. Um, and we aren't providing, um, you know, a lot of knowledge and education for our communities to really understand how important it is for our African-American and Black populations to donate blood. Um, so one thing that I wanted to bring up is um, not only just the importance of a diverse blood supply, but just the um, long-standing history of our African-American populations with the American Red Cross. Um, and I know just last month we celebrated Black History Month and what better way to start this presentation off than to talk about two great African-American men that played a major part in the American Red Cross. And the first being, um, of course, Dr. Charles Drew. Um, Dr. Charles Drew was known as the father of blood banking. He was um, an African-American. He was a surgeon, he was an educator as well as a scientist who helped shape the blood services industry as we see it today. Um, so in about uh, 1940s, he laid the groundwork for today's modern blood donation um, program through his invention, uh, work in blood banking. Um, the American Red Cross blood program started in 1940 and was under the leadership of Dr. Charles Drew, who became the first medical director of the American Red Cross in 1941. Another great African-American man that played a major role in the American Red Cross was Dr. Jerome H. Holland. And Dr. Jerome H. Holland was a passionate advocate um, for blood research, and he was a leader of our blood services program. Um, during his time at Hampton University in 1964, Dr. Holland became a member of the American Red Cross Board of Governors. Um, Dr. Holland was later appointed by President Jimmy Carter to be the chairman of the American Red Cross Board of Governors in 1979, and he was the first African-American to hold this position. Um, while serving on the board, Dr. Holland showed a passion for blood research and took the lead in consolidating growing laboratory 
operations for the American Red Cross Blood Services Program. He encouraged the American Red Cross regions to integrate um, their volunteers um, services so it could be extended to the entire community regardless of a person's ethnicity or background. So, wow, we have two great examples of two powerful African-American men that played such an important role in the American Red Cross. Um, so you ask yourself, why do we need a diversity in blood supply? Um, one thing that I truly do enjoy about working for the American Red Cross is they truly see the importance of having our blood supply reflect our communities. Um, and so a lot of times we know blood types, we know A, B, and O. Um, but there is also antigens in our blood, um, and our antigens vary by our race and ethnicity. Um, and so with that being said, patients requiring frequent blood transfusions um, basically need um, blood transfusions or, you know, blood units from donors of the same ethnic or genetic background. Um, so it's so, so very important for our blood supply to be diverse. Um, so that we're able to help all of our patients that are in need and not just even our sickle cell patients, but all of our patients. Um, so it's just so very important. Um, another thing, um, African-American patients with sickle cell disease are less likely to have physical reactions to blood donated by other African-Americans. Um, and that's really truly based on what I just mentioned in regards to the antigens in the blood. Um, also, African-American donors are almost three times more likely to match the blood donated for sickle cell patients than our non-African-American donors. Um, and it ex is extremely important to increase the number of avail available blood donors from all ethnic groups, and we can't stress that enough, um, but, you know, definitely for our sickle cell patients. Um, so with that being said, um, you ask, how can you help? Um, and one of the ways in which you can help is um, we're constantly um, trying to um, educate our communities and um, host different blood drives. And I was able to have the honor and pleasure of um, reaching out to Monica as well as Alicia. Um, and we decided to have our own blood drive, which will be Tuesday, April 6th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and this is in celebration of National Minority Health Month, month which is in April. Um, and this month basically seeks to raise awareness about health disparities among our um, ethnic, various ethnic backgrounds. Um, the location will be at Friendship Baptist Church in Albany, Georgia. Um, and to schedule an appointment for this blood drive is quite simple. All you would simply do is go to our website, which is www.redcrossblood.org, and you would use the sponsor key code and choose your appointment time. And so we have our goal set at 20. Um, we're also offering an incentive for every patient that comes to that blood drive, they'll receive a $10 Amazon e-gift card. Um, and so we would just love to see you there. Um, and if it's your first time being a blood donor, we hope that that uh, continues for you as well. So um, American Red Cross is doing something we're really super excited about. Um, we're obviously for those who donate blood, they will get their blood tested for COVID antibodies um, to see if they've been exposed to COVID. It's not the actual COVID test. It's not to say if you have COVID or not, it's just to see if you're, you know, you have the antibodies. And come April 1st, we also are testing for the sickle cell trait, which we're so, so excited about. So um, for our patients um, that mark um, their ethnicity as African-American, um, their blood will be tested for the sickle cell trait. Um, and I think that that's so very important um, because um, a lot of times, you know, there's not necessarily a cure for this. Um, but we could prevent it by providing the education for our, our youth and our adults and our parents um, on the importance of the trait. Because as we know, um, if you have the trait and you decide to have offspring with someone who also has the trait, there is a higher possibility that your child will come out having the disease. Um, and so we just want to continue to provide that education for our communities. 
Um, so a lot of people quite naturally, we are in a pandemic and people um, kind of shy away um, from donating blood. Um, but uh, want to reassure you that, you know, of course, we're following all CDC guidelines, temperature checks and masks, cleaning procedures and all of that. Um, and I like to let people know that this really truly can all be done virtually per se, um, in the sense that um, we're engaging you virtually, we're having these informational sessions so that you feel comfortable with the process. Um, you're able to schedule your appointment virtually. Um, and it's just like going to a doctor's appointment. Um, you know, you're just going in at your scheduled time, donating your blood and coming right back out. Um, and so it is very, very safe. Um, and so here's just a quick short video I'm going to share, and I might have to reshare my screen. So I'm going to stop sharing because I need to share the volume part. So let's see if I can redo that one second. Okay, let's see. Just giving blood is just something, it just feels like it's just a gift. It, I don't want anything back in return, but if I know it can help at least one person, I feel good knowing that that one person has a chance to live. It's important to me as, uh, you know, an African-American, you know, to donate blood. I started donating blood maybe about seven years ago when a friend of mine, her son, had sickle cell and she wanted to have a blood drive. So we put one together and ever since then I've been donating blood. I keep coming back because I know the importance of um, blood donations. I've had several co-workers and friends who have really benefited from the fact of um, people donating blood. I have several friends that have had to have blood transfusions even here recently. So it's just compelled me to take another step and do what I could to help them out. You never know when you may need blood or someone close to you may need blood. You know, I understand, you know, we coming out during the time of the pandemic, but uh, I had no problems coming out. It was a great experience. The staff is great, easy to work with, funny, and make it pleasant for you. The American Red Cross has all the safety measures in place. It was straightforward. Mask, took the temperature at the front desk, had sanitizer available. Oh, the process is very safe. Um, I felt welcomed, I felt comforted. Um, I am not one that really likes needles, um, but again, because I am so passionate about the fact of giving back, I make that sacrifice. And I just keep coming back because I know how important it is. So I um, just encourage anybody who wants to give back to their community to come and do it. Once you give, you'll keep giving because you realize how many people you are actually helping. We're saving lives. Every little bit counts. <laughs> so yes, um, we are definitely saving lives. Giving blood is such a life changing experience. I mean, it's literally saving someone's life. It's allowing them not to be in that pain crisis. Um, and, as, and as the video stated, um, you know, you just never know when you might need blood, when someone close to you might need blood. And it just extends so far beyond, um, you know, what we want, might imagine. Um, for example, my mother, she suffers from lupus um, and uh, was recently hospitalized and her uh, white blood cell counts were low and she had to have a blood transfusion. Um, and so, I mean, just that quick in the moment she needed it. And so um, we just wanna keep bringing about awareness again, um, for patients battling sickle cell during this pandemic. Um, so again, thank you, Monica, for having me and um, I'll turn it back over to you. And I, I think you're on mute, Monica. Thank you, Mariah. That was a lot of good information. And I like the fact that you did the black history on American Red Cross, which is so important because sometimes people need to see somebody look like them in order to donate which is great. And I'm, I'm a volunteer for the April 6th um, blood drive since I can't be a donor because I have sickle cell as well as congestive heart failure, but I am gonna be there as a volunteer, passing out snacks, making sure people are registering, whatever they need me to be there for is it's, it's for a great cause. And definitely sickle cell patients in this community 
community can definitely benefit from it. The next person that I'm gonna bring up is my partner in the sickle cell community in the Southwest Georgia region. And that is none other than Alicia Lewis. She is the founder of Genesic Nonprofit Organization. Alicia, take the floor. There, hi, hi everyone, great morning still um, going into the afternoon. Um, I have my sister over here. She is the CFO of Genasic. Um, thank you, Monica, for inviting us uh, to participate in Come Hub with us. So like Monica stated, my name is Alicia Lewis, founder and CEO of Genasic Nonprofit. Uh, this is our logo. Um, I'm truly grateful that you, Monica, are a part of our team as we continue to move forward and restore the services uh, that was being provided as far as sickle cell um, clinic was here uh, in Albany, Georgia. So we're working to restore those services. So I just want to first introduce our nonprofit, uh, give you a few information, and then um, go from there. So Genesic Nonprofit um, Organization, which uh, started in March of 2018 is going on three years. I'm truly excited about that. So we have decided to um, take, uh, take charge of um, raising funds uh, to uh, build a clinic here. Um, we're raising funds currently. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to uh, communicate uh, about our nonprofit is we are embracing sickle cell communities with a touch of hope. That's our slogan for our nonprofit. Again, embracing sickle cell communities with a touch of hope. Um, one of the uh, things about us is we are a 501c3 uh, charitable, charitable nonprofit uh, health and wellness organization um, that is uh, focused on understanding the health challenges um, that um, deals with sickle cell and blood disorders, um, and as well as promoting um, general health resources through educational programs and events. And our goal again, as stated, is to raise funds so we can be able to uh, build uh, our own clinic here in Albany, Georgia. But for the time being, we are working towards restoring uh, the services that was uh, once being uh, provided um, from the, the previous clinic that was here. Um, hopefully, we'll, we will know about that very soon. So I'm crossing my fingers uh, that we can be able to bring back the, the clinic this year. So Again, I will, I will let everyone know about that. But uh, in the meantime, uh, as Mariah stated, uh, we are hosting a blood drive and I will be donating blood. This will be my first time uh, donating blood. So I'm excited about that. So uh, please come um, to our, our drive. It's April 6th. Um, that is on a Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. is at Friendship Baptist Church uh, Fellowship Hall. That is 400 Pine Avenue, Albany, Georgia, 31701. That is 400 Pine Avenue, Albany, Georgia, 31701. And also, uh, you can um, go visit our website at www.genesic nonprofit.org that is www.genesic nonprofit.org please visit our website um, also follow us on facebook and instagram to see what the latest um, events that we are hosting so thank you monica for allowing us <laughs> to uh, come in and speak to um, your audience about what we're up to Thank you, Alicia. Um, let me see if Toriana's here before I get into the questions. Um, I I don't see Toriana. I'm, I'm going to um, give you a little back history, a little back information as to why Come Hub With Us was started. As a sickle cell patient and, and a patient advocate, I began to receive so many questions from people, family members, and people in the community when they reach out to me as to what their loved one that have sickle cell need. And being a patient myself, they need a sickle cell specialist. 
They need a primary care physician. They need a they need nurses, nurses in the medical field, in the hospital, home health care. They need nurses in every medical facility that's available that they go, that they're going to come in contact with, because you're going to come to you're going to come in contact with more than just nurses at the hospital or the medical facility or at the at a clinic. You're going to come in contact with all types of nurses. And I also had a home health nurse. So it's important that um, you have the person's you know, different nurses in their roles, as well as a licensed clinical social worker. And now with so many community health workers coming out, so you can receive this service from a community health worker or a licensed social worker, they're going to get you all the resources that you need, the resources that you yourself can't get. My social worker got me everything I needed when I couldn't get it. And if it hadn't been for her, there were, there would have been a lot of things I would not have been able to get. So me having my oxygen tank, me having my portable tank, home tank, um, me able, to, I was able to get my medical, my medicine for a year because at that time I had no income and I was on a 340B plan. It was so important that I had that relationship with my social worker, as well as a nutritionist. You're definitely going to need a nutrition because we know that a healthy lifestyle does help in your health journey. It doesn't cure everything, but it does help and it does make your health journey easy. And we know that if you're going to different medical facilities and need medical services, you're definitely gonna need health insurance. And you can get health insurance through your social worker or you can go to an agent yourself and get the health insurance that you need. I have health insurance and I remember an agent from United Healthcare was able to get me a more additional health insurance for because of the fact that I had congestive heart failure. It is so important to also have a caregiver, whether that caregiver is your parent, which my mother is my caregiver, your spouse, your siblings, friends. There have been moments when my friends became my caregiver, especially when I was in college or I was um, away at work. And my, my friends and coworkers became my caregiver. You need to be able to identify who your caregiver is. There are also caregivers that are paid caregivers. Well, you go to the agency and do a caregiver. And some caregivers can actually talk you. It depends on the level of or your very important that you know who your medical team is. And that's, that's the number one advice I give to people. Make sure you know who your loved ones or your patient team is. And I know a lot of times people feel like they should only just have a sickle cell specialist. That you need as well. So it, it, it's important and they can also prevent a lot of things. And I love the fact that my primary care physician, that's one of the things he do. He'll look at, he looked at my family medical history. He was like, well, Monica, according to you, there's a family history of heart disease, as well as a lot of people in your families have had strokes and so many different things. So what we're going to do is make sure that you don't have a stroke or you can manage your heart disease. And definitely, because diabetes run heavily in my family, on my mother's side, as well as my definitely my father's side. So in, in our care plan, the goal is to for me not to become a diabetic. And of course, that will come with the lifestyle that I have. So it's important that you build that relationship with your medical team so you can prevent some things as well. And it's important to have knowledge about these things as well. That's another thing that when I'm working with patients and working with different people, I always tell them some information you can look up yourself or your medical professional will give you a brochure or they'll give you something with that information on it. And it's important that you take the time, you as well as your caregiver or whoever else supporter that you want to share the information with and have a discussion about. It is so important because doctors and nurses and medical professionals see a lot of people every day. So they may or may not remember your case or they may make a mistake because they're dealing with so many people every day. 
and you're one person, so you're able to take care of what your needs are. And the things that you don't understand, always write them down or journal them. My therapist recommended that for me. I was a journaler. I journaled before my diagnosis, but I began to do a different type of journaling after my diagnosis. And I do both. I'm still old school. I do the paper journal as well as the electronic journal. It's also important that you journalize what's going on with you because sometimes you are not able to talk to someone. But it's very important that you share your feelings too. And one of the things that I've noticed that has helped me in the process as well is being able to talk to my medical professional and some of the medicine they, they have given me, I'm like, I can't take this because I'm not functional. So what they have done is reduce the dosage. Or instead of taking it in the morning, I take the medicine at bedtime. It, it just, it varies on what's going on. And I greatly appreciate that if I hadn't have documented that or I haven't journalized it or expressed that to my medical team, I don't think it would have been done. That is so important. And that's why I have this annual come up with us because this is a resource event for sickle cell patients. My focus is adults living with sickle cell patients because there are not that many resources for adults living with sickle cell. And when I was diagnosed in 2013, the resources were very, very limited. And I remember when I was diagnosed, they gave me a 706 number. So I'm like, well, why am I getting a 706 number? So the specialist that was working with me is out of Augusta, Georgia. Dr. Kular is one of the professors as well as the doctor at the adult sickle cell clinic in Augusta, Georgia. So that's what made me became a serious patient advocate for the Southwest Georgia region. Another thing that, uh, that makes me even more passionate about my work is the fact that they closed our clinic. They closed our clinic a few years ago, and my question became, so where do patients go if they're going through a sickle cell crisis or a vasoucleosis crisis? Where do they go and what do they do? And one of my accomplishments that I'm proud of, and it's just one solution, it's not the only solution, but one of the things I did is I, I developed a relationship with an account manager at the Global Partnership for Telehealth, that organization. So currently adult sickle cell patients are able or have access to telehealth. So they have the service and access to a sickle cell specialist, they have to go to Sylvester, Georgia, which is only 30 minutes away from here. And that's to stabilize them if they need stabilizer. But if you're doing a routine checkup, telehealth will work for you. And you don't have to drive four hours to Augusta, Georgia, or you don't have to drive three hours to Atlanta, Georgia. But when it comes to um, emergency uh, services, like you in a serious pain crisis, or you need to have some type of surgery, or you need certain things, of course, telehealth doesn't fix that. You're gonna have to see a oncologist, hematologist here, or you're gonna have to talk to your sickle cell specialist and they're gonna partner with a oncologist, hematologist here to get you what you need. And it is so important that you, we continue to build relationships with Phoebe Cancer Center, which is where one of the places that sickle cell patients go to because that's where the oncologists, hematologists are. And I know I'm one of them, I'm guilty too. I hate going to the emergency room because they may see you, they may not see you. It may take a long time for them to see you. No matter what the case is, and especially now during a pandemic, it's even a greater challenge to be seen, especially when you're going through a crisis. And not only are you going through a pain crisis, you could have developed a virus or bacteria or something else could be going on with you. And that's something I'm continuously working on. More resources, more access. I'm continuing to network with medical professionals in the Southwest Georgia region, as well as globally. I reach out to people that can help the Southwest Georgia region. This is my headquarters, but I only, I'm not only helping people in Albany in the Southwest Georgia region, I'm also helping people around the world because people reach out to me through social media or they contact me on my personal phone and ask me questions and what do I recommend and how can you help me and can you help me with this? And that is something I have done. And 
my and I, I'm, I'm so honored that people reach out to me because I'm a sickle cell patient that's 46 years, 45 years old, getting ready to turn 46 years old. Because in times past, most sickle cell patients they didn't live until the, the age of eight. Some of them they they were in times past known as children that come and go. So sickle cell patients didn't live long. Then through time, sickle cell patients begin to live up to the age of eight. Through medical changes and medical advances, then they change the number to 18. Most patients, sickle cell patients, don't live up until the age of 18. Then again, medical advances, then they change it to the age of 21. And I think some people are still at the age of 18 and 21, but sickle cell patients are living longer. And I I know and I think that's the reason why it's harder to find resources for adult sickle cell patients because people still are at they're stopping at most patients don't live till the age of 18 or they don't live past the age of 21. And that's constantly changing that and I'm out there being that face or I'm being that voice for the younger generation so they can see that sickle cell patients can live a full and healthy life over the age of 40, over the age of 50, over the age of 60, over the age of 70. And actually one of the things that I keep on me prior to the pandemic, when I was a vendor at different health fairs, was I would keep a picture of the lady that um, is a African native. And she lived to be 90, the last um, uh, picture that I have, she was 94 years old, living with sickle cell disease, living a full life, living a healthy life. And, and I think that that picture is on my social media platform. And it gives people hope that sickle cell patients are living longer. And another um, picture that I have is a guy that's in Chicago. The picture is old, but at the time he was 70 years old. He was an African-American male with sickle cell disease and they were celebrating his 70th birthday party. And I think that is phenomenal. And I've been to conferences where they will bring uh, patients that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s to the stage so they can tell their story and encourage the younger generation that it's okay, you're gonna live longer. Medical professionals are gonna only tell you what they know and what they understand. If they feel like looking at your case, you're only gonna to live to the age of 18, that's just, that's what they know. That's what their textbooks have told them. But you can live longer. You can live a longer, healthier life. And I'm proof of that. There are people that are on my platform that are proof of that, that sickle cell patients are living a healthier life. Another thing that I want to emphasize before we go into the questions, because I do see that we have some questions. I want to emphasize the fact that I know when most people think of sickle cell patients, they think of a patient that's always in pain. They're always in the hospital. They're always hurting. They're always... And there I, know, there I know there are a lot of stereotypes associated with sickle cell, and they're not good stereotypes either. Um, drug seekers, they don't live long, they're this, they're that. But I often tell people, I know some phenomenal sickle cell patients. They're, they're patient and they're patient advocates. They're running nonprofit organization. I mean, they have their moments where they're taking time off. Um, some of the people that I look at and often talk about is uh, Cassandra Tremell. She's one of the founders of Sickle Cell 101. You have Shamonica Wiggins, who's a part of the Sickle Cell Consortium, but she was originally a part of Bold Lips for Sickle Cell. You have Clayton Smith, who's in behavioral health, who's a sickle cell patient, and he's doing things for patients in the area of behavioral health and mental health. There are so many people, um, Andre Harris, he's one of the people, he's doing his things where he's constantly being educated, and he started an organization, um, Social Workers for African American Males for Sickle Cell. So there are, a, and the Sickle Cell Consortium, which is the number one organization to me, it is a organization for patients and is ran by patients. I love that organization. It is a great resource to have. Dr. Le Lakia Bailey is the founder of that organization. That organization is still running. It's still a great resource to have. And the people that are independent patients, you have people that are in that community that are patients, 
patient advocates, caregivers, medical professionals, people that are part of other medical organizations that are all coming together for this one cause, this one focus to make sure people know about sickle cell and make sure they emphasize the importance of sickle cell awareness. And everybody know T Boss has sickle cell aware, uh, has sickle cell, and she's been promoting on her platform as well as Spencer Ware, which is an NFL player. He's also on the platform about sickle cell as well, which is so important too. And Jordan Sparks, I was in California a couple of years ago when um, Jordan Sparks has a campaign to tell your sickle cell story. She have a partnership with Novartis Physical. Uh, pharmaceutical company where patients are telling their stories and I had the opportunity to share my story of uh, being diagnosed at the tender age of 38 years old and being a sickle cell advocate for my being a patient and a patient advocate for my community and what makes me so passionate about what I do is because I'm an adult sickle cell patient looking for resources and looking for connection and making sure I'm providing what I need for not only myself, but other adult sickle cell patients in this community. And I not only provide services for myself, I don't exclude pediatric patients, but my focus is adult patients. If a pedi When pediatric patients come to me, I still provide resources to them. I still talk to them. I don't exclude, exclude them, but my primary focus is adult patients because there are less resources for us. And I'm, I'm happy that things are continuing to go forward. It is so important that we continue to go forward with sickle cell. And one of the things that I want to kind of bring out and kind of brag about just a little bit um, is, I don't know if people know, but the mother that was on Coming to America, uh, Leo Leon, she was actually diagnosed with sickle cell. And according to an article that I read, that is what she passed away from. I don't think she passed away from sickle cell itself. I think she may have passed away from the complications of sickle cell. One of the people that I, 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 I'm, I'm an advocate for because he has transitioned, but he's been a great resource to me. And that is Myron Sherman. And he often talk about most patients don't die from sickle cell itself. They die from the complications of sickle cell. And that, that is a big thing that's on my platform as well. I don't just focus on the sickle cell disease itself. I focus on the different complications of sickle cell. As a patient that have sickle cell beta thalassemia, and congestive heart failure. I know how important it is to not just focus on sickle cell itself, but to also focus on the complications of it. It is so important. And I like how Dr. Vick is talking about they're focusing on the whole person. One of the things that I'm also going to continue to share on my platform is the um, International um, Nurses Association, and I know I just messed that up, the International Association of Sickle Cell Nurses, Dr. Vicky, I know you're going to correct me on that, but um, that organization is doing a conference April the 14th and the 15th. It's a free conference. I'm already registered. I recommend that everybody that's on, that's on this um, conference, as well as this, I see people that have logged in on uh, Facebook that are watching on YouTube as well as Facebook. I recommend you all join this um, conference. It's so important. There's going to be a lot of great speakers as well as a wealth of information. And it's only two days. I highly recommend that you register for this conference and participate in this conference, especially if you know someone with sickle cell and you want to know more about sickle cell. With that being said, we're going to get into the questions. And one of the questions, let me get my questions out. One of the questions that I, I see um, was that this question is for Dr. Vic. Um, the question is, with, um, with the nurses, our nurses taught about DEXA scans? Because I noticed you had on, the, on your presentation the muscular a mus muscular part of having sickle cell. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know a little bit more about that. So um, I would say no, that up to now, there has not been education about bone scans or DEXA scans in um, with patients that have sickle cell. So that would be, so, you know, we're so compartmentalized in healthcare in some ways. We have this expert in this area, this expert in this area, et cetera. Um, it should be, I would think, a part of um, routine screening. 
that the primary care provider, so a nurse practitioner might recommend that that is done. Um, and we certainly know when people have, um, are having experiencing pain, um, sc bone scans or CT scans would be helpful in um, determining what and where the problem is. Um, I have certainly heard of very significant bone damage done and developmental concerns in um, children uh, that have sickle cell. And so we know that that's a, that should, I know that that should be a part of um, the health record and the information that we obtain when we're collecting a health history to help us in decision-making. But it's not traditionally a part of that, the modules or the education programming currently being provided to nurses. So I hope I've answered that question. You did, you did. Okay. Okay. But I believe it should be a part of it. So thank you. You're welcome. The next question is for Mariah. Mariah, is there anyone that cannot donate? Um, that's always a tough question because everyone's situation varies. Um, so what we always recommend at the American Red Cross is to call the 1-800 Red Cross eligibility number um, because everyone's situation is different and they can talk and speak more to those specific things um, that may um, hinder a person from donating. What we always like to recommend though is we do have a high deferral rate for our African-American and black populations. Um, so the day, you know, before you donate, make sure that you're drinking lots of water and you're staying hydrated, um, that you're eating iron rich foods, um, that you you've taken your, um, your um, blood pressure medicine, if that's something so that you won't have to get, um, you know, told that you're un you can't donate because your blood pressure is too high or they can't find a vein because you're dehydrated. Um, and we tend to see those de high deferral rates with our African-American donors. So um, that's always something that's um, to keep in mind. But as far as eligibility concerns, to call that 1-800 Red Cross number to see if there's anything that would hinder you from coming to donate blood. Thank you. I think you're on mute, Monica. Dr. Vick, I think this question is for you. What foods do you recommend for an active person with sickle cell? Okay, um, I got to watch that mute button too. So, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I'm not a nutritionist. That's not my expertise. Although as an, um, in nursing, we do take nutrition classes. But what I would suggest is, um, a general healthy diet that's going to support support red blood cell formation. So, um, you know, iron rich foods, folic B vitamin uh, enriched foods, those kinds of things. Um, that's what I would recommend uh, that a patient eat. Um, but I would I I would do an appropriate referral as you suggested to a nutritionist who could work with that patient. Maybe they have other um, health issues. Um, you shared other health issues along with the sickle cell. So we want to make sure that people are eating a proper diet based on what their, their whole picture is. So again, I'm not a nutritionist. That's not my area of expertise, but we do know that certain, I mean, it, there's certain things that are fairly obvious in terms of helping that uh, person with sickle cell disease. That's true. And I know what, what for me, one of the things that have worked really well with me is having a neutral bullet and doing smoothies. I feel better. I can do a lot more. And I know folic acids. I, and I talk to my medical team about this often. I am on 800 uh, MCGs of folic acid. What I do know is that green vegetables are high in folic acid. I love spinach, kale, broccoli, turnip greens, um, the, and that's good to have beets because beets does thicken in the blood. Definitely water. To me, the key is hydration, 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 um, because when sickle cell um, occurs is because the round blood cells have become crescent shaped due to a lack of oxygen in parts of the body. That's one of the things that I do recommend. And I have seen some patients 
experience high dehydration. So it is very, very important to drink uh, plenty of water. And I know people often say, Monica, do you only drink Fiji water? No, I actually drink whatever is available, whatever I have at the time. Like right now I'm drinking um, Deer Park. I don't always drink Fiji water. Um, but one caution that I do want to uh, put out there too is um, I've, I've come across a lot of people um, that have DVT or PE, which means they have blood clots on the lungs or in the body. PE mean blood clots on the lungs and DVT mean blood, uh, blood clots in other parts of the body. So you want to be careful with green vegetables as well. I have not personally experienced that, but I do know people that have experienced that and a couple of my patients have experienced that. So you definitely want to be careful with that and make, let me make sure I put my disclaimer out there, which I usually do in the beginning, but I didn't this time, but I am not a licensed medical professional. So I do recommend people to other uh, medical professionals. I, but from my experience and from working with other patients, that's, that's um, try to avoid, because um, I know it's not easy staying away from fried foods or fast foods, because fast foods and a lot of foods are processed foods. They're not the healthiest, but they are the most convenient. And I've worked with patients, especially older African-American patients who said they're not going to give up certain things. They're not going to give up their oxtails. They're not going to give up their collard greens, turnip green, mustard greens. There's certain things they're just not going to give up. They're not going to give up their deep fried fish. Despite of what's going on in their health, there's like, Monica, I'm just, I'm not going to give it up. One of the things I often talk to them about is even if you don't give it up, do it in moderation. Um, even if you don't give up oxtails this, even if you eat oxtails this Sunday, try to skip next Sunday or try to do that at least once a month instead of every Sunday. If, if you're eating deep fried fish, try not to do deep fried fish every Friday. Um, fry it this Friday, maybe bake it the next Friday and grill it the next Friday or Try to try to mix it up or try not to um, remove all the, the nutrients when you cook your green vegetables. Cause you know, I'm 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 guilty of it as well. Um, a lot of people like their food to be seasoned, heavily seasoned. But when you overcook them, then you're killing the nutrients in them anyway. And sometimes it's it's better to eat certain vegetables raw. That that's one of the things that I do. Um, Wednesday, on Wednesday is, is what I call my detox day. And, 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 and lately it has been varying, depends on what's going on in my life. Um, I would, in the morning, I have either a, mostly a smoothie. I, I may do oatmeal, but my number one thing is, is a smoothie that detoxifies everything out. And then every, nothing is cooked. Everything is, is frozen or is fresh. So I do my smoothies in the morning. I do a salad for lunch. Um, it depends on different things because sometimes I'll do a salad with meat or I'll do a salad without meat. So if I do a salad with meat at lunchtime, chances are I'm not gonna do a salad with meat at dinner time because you have to detox the body. You have to. Some people don't think you, you should, but you should. And a lot of health issues do come from improper diet. I know people don't like to hear that, but some things do come from improper diet. And there are a lot of sickle cell patients that also have diabetes. So they have to watch their sugar, sodium, and their different intakes as well. It's so important that it, in times past, that was something I hated, that was reading labels. But because I have a congestive heart failure, I have to monitor my fluid level. I'm only allowed 2,000 milliliters a day of fluid, and that includes food as well as drink. So if I drink a soup, I got to look at how many milliliters of soup, maybe uh, 12 ounces of soup, 
or 500 milliliters, 500 milliliters of soup. So that, that has killed my 200 milliliters right there, just eating that, that soup. So I have to uh, be careful with that and monitor that. Definitely monitor uh, sodium because sodium does retain fluids. I've experienced that. I've heard about it, but I've experienced that myself, whether I take my medicine for congestive heart failure or not, which I do take it every day on a daily basis. But I can tell when I eat a lot of foods that are high in sodium. If I may be at a family event or a family function or I'm around family for the weekend and I'm going to eat whatever is prepared because, you know, you like uh, mama or auntie. My aunties make certain foods that I love. My mom makes certain foods that I love that may be high in sodium or high in sugar because, you know, everybody know my weakness is my mama's butter pound cake. That is my weakness, but I don't eat it every day. I don't eat it every month. I don't eat it often, but every now and then I do have a taste for that butter pound cake and I, and I do consume that. I don't do it all the time, but I do consume that. And, and my focus on people when I talk to patients is not to take anything away from you, but to make sure you're balancing everything out. And there have been some patients that don't have sickle cell, but are diabetic patients. And one of the things that I talked to them about from research and talking to other medical professionals, because um, I have medical professionals that I do get medical advice from, and type two diabetes is lifestyle. So if you change certain things, I have met people who were diabetic, but once they changed their lifestyle, they no longer were diabetic. And I do know some people that are borderline diabetic. When you're borderline diabetic, you need to focus on what you need to eat, what you don't need to eat, and what, and definitely include an active lifestyle, even if it's just walking. And I know some people say, well, I don't have uh, equipment at my home, or I don't have a gym membership, or I don't do this. I walk in my neighborhood. I walk, I originally started out work, walking 30 minutes a day. Then that changed to an hour. I'll do an hour in the morning and I'll do an hour in the evening. It's free. You just walking in your neighborhood or I like to go to Pecan Grove, which is an area not too far from where I live. Or I'll go to a park and go and walk for, uh, for a certain period of time just to make sure I'm um, heart healthy. It's, it's very important to be heart healthy or make sure you keep an active life. And, and some people feel like they have to play sports. You don't necessarily have to play sports. But one of the things that I, I have done in the past, and I do it often on, I'm guilty of that, is virtually I would do Pilates or I would virtually do yoga. There, there's a person online that I reach out to when I need a yoga class or when I need a Pilates class because it's like I need to mix it up a little bit or a dance class, which is something you're not going to see me post on my social media. But I'll put on music and dance as long as I'm active, especially when I'm in meetings because I'm a part of, of, of several organizations where some meetings are like four or five hours long and they'll give us an hour break. And then I'm in a community health working tr worker training where class is from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So we have an hour lunch break from 11 to one and I'll get up and move around or I get up and dance because I know I'll be sitting down for another hour, another two or three hours. So you definitely want to stay active even if you're just dancing in your house and, and you're not recording, but you're, you're moving around, you're active. It's so important to just be active all together. And I think people make being active bigger than what it is. You don't have to have a gym membership. You don't have to have uh, gym equipment in your house. Just walking or putting on a YouTube video that can help you with other options. I'm going to say it that way, other options, whether it's yoga, whether it's Pilates, or whether it's um, some type of walking and movement or some type of dance video or some type of... Um, aquatic aerobics or some type of cardio aerobics because they do have a lot of youtube videos on that i'm subscribed to some of the channels that do great cardio they also do cardio in a chair or in a wheelchair light exercise and you won't go into a sickle cell crisis that's another thing sickle cell patients can't do extreme exercises no way we have to be moderate in our exercises. You can't do too much because you don't want to go into a sickle cell crisis. And you definitely don't want to have to be rushed to the emergency room. 
but it's so important to keep a active lifestyle. It's also important to look into, because I know currently here at our local hospital, there is a nutri there actually there are three nutritions that you can speak with about how to do meal planning. Um, I had her for my first come up with us and she did go over a lot of great ideas and meal preparations that help with people that have diabetes or sickle cell. And another thing that she talked about that I do myself as well, you kind of want to culturally mix it up as well. Um, one of the things I, and I, mod, I um, do it in moderation too. You might want to mix up and have some Caribbean food. Um, she definitely recommend Mediterranean food, Asian cuisine, Indian cuisine, African cuisine. So you, you want to mix it up a little bit, not just always so food or just one type of food. You want to mix it up with a, um, um, Caribbean food. I like Caribbean food, so I do different uh, Caribbean recipes, and oxtails is one of them, but I, I use a small amount of oxtails, uh, maybe a spoonful. I'll cook a spoonful with some basmati rice. Basmati rice is a Mediterranean rice, so you definitely want to mix up your food as well as your exercise and your lifestyle all together. And to see how you're doing, again, I recommend you kind of journalize that to see where you're at and see where you're going and kind of um, design a, a, a strategy or a plan for that. Decide that um, I might not start out to walk in five days a week, but I'm going to start off walking one day a week. I, I'll start my week off and, and walk 30 minutes on Monday or I'll walk 30 minutes on Wednesday or I'll walk 30 minutes on Friday because I know what I'm about to eat. So let me go out, go on ahead and get that on out the way. Or let me, and I've seen some people on TikTok where they walk around in their house. They'll walk around from room to room for 30 minutes. That's another option for people that are not uh, leaving their homes because of the pandemic. That's another option to have. And you definitely want to look at that as an option. And, but I think you can come up with different ways and, and find creative ways to improve your health journey. That is so important. Make it fun. I always tell people, make it fun. Go, go walk in the park if that's going to make, make, make you do exercise or go to an event and don't park close up to parking. Kind of park far, far away from the venue and walk to it. Like we have the Flint River here where you can uh, walk down by the river walk. We have, we have a, a river walk here. So walk down there for 30 minutes and then you'll get a good view of the, of the, of the lake or you we have lakes where people can sit and just enjoy the view. Enjoy the peaceful sound of the lake or Lake Loretta or wherever or Radium Springs Garden. Beautiful, beautiful view. Walk around there for 30 minutes and enjoy it. And for those fishermen, people like to fish, walk around the lake for 30 minutes, something simple, something easy. Since you're gonna be there anyway, just enjoy it and make the most of it. That is that's that is always my recommendation to people. And I always wish people the best in their health journey. If they have questions, they know they can always reach out to me. If I don't have the answers, I will refer you to someone who can get you the answer. I want to say a special thank you to every, to all of the speakers who came. Thank you for the information. Thank you for the wealth of knowledge. Thank you for taking this time out on your busy Saturday morning to be with us for the fourth annual Sickle Cell Awareness Meeting entitled Come Hub With Us. And I definitely want to give a special shout out to my two sponsors, which um, SWGA Sickle Cell Awareness, which is my organization, as well as Virtual Insight Professional Administrative Services. Because of these two organizations, we're able to put on the fourth annual Come Hub With Us um, meeting. And one more shout out I want to give to WALB for promoting this event on television. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, uh, the, the newsroom and the team at WALB ALB for promoting this event for us. That concludes this meeting. You all have a wonderful day. Goodbye.